I was happy to be co-author of two papers about fundamental limits in quantum metrology. Yes, and one paper was written together with uh, Rafał Demkowicz Dobrzański and Jan Tchaikovsky. And this was a very theoretical paper. And the second one was written with the experimental group from uh, Basel University. And this phrase, fundamental limitation, it has completely different meanings in, in, in these two papers. That's why today I would like to present uh, some practical point of view on uh, what is phase and certainty of phase and, and how it's measured. So the outline of this talk is as follows. I prepared a long introduction about um, Ramsey interferometer. Then I will tell you how to apply, employ both the Einstein condensate to that. What is phase uncertainty? And uh, I would present experimental results. Actually, this will be more experimental talk. So let's start with a Michelson interferometer. Uh, it's a very simple and known tool from 19th century. So you have some port, you inject light. This light is splitted by beam splitter into two beams. One is reflected, the second is transmitted. They both reflect from their mirrors, M1 and M2, and they meet in screen when we can see the interference pattern. The whole idea of this uh, device is to, uh, to measure some, some differences in phase in these two beams. The problem is when we discuss uh, quantum phase. And this is better to understand, I think, in a Ramsey interferometer. So now I will go through Ramsey interferometer and I will try to present this interferometer step by step. So our system of interest are, is any system which has only two levels. I think this is enough to, to understand the concept of this interferometer. I denoted these two levels with one and two and assume that they have energy E1 and E2. And if they are completely isolated from environment, so there are no couplings to other fields, uh, we consider only these two level systems, then Hamiltonian is equal to projection on the first state times its energy plus projection on the second state times its energy. Okay, so let's start with this Ramsey sequence. The first step of the sequence is just to prepare atoms, all of them in the same internal state, let's say state one. Usually there are, there are such methods that, uh, let's say, well, in practice they are selecting atoms with some magnetic field. So first uh, these atoms are cooled, there are some filters, uh, then there is some magnetic field gradient such that at the end there is cloud with atoms, all of them in the same internal state denoted with one. Then second step of a Ramsey interferometer is to apply pi over two pars. And pi over two pass is such transformation, which is in this red frame, uh, that <coughs> it takes state in one into superposition, half half superposition, one plus two. If in the input would be state two, then the superposition would be two minus one. In reality, this is some sequence of, uh, of uh, laser passes with, with uh, well controlled power with well-controlled frequency and uh, it's possible to realize such gate in a, in a real experiment. It's quite simple actually. It's done uh, since more than half of the century. So in this Ramsey sequence after pi over two pass, every atom is in the superposition one plus two. Then step three, which is the crucial one, is, is just free dynamics. So we assume that during time TR, which is usually called interrogation time or Ramsey time, we assume that during this time, nothing is happening. So in reality, atoms are often in the free fall. It's, it's desired that they, they are not coupled to anything. And then the whole evolution is generated by this Hamiltonian, which was in the green frame, namely the state at the end of this, uh, this interrogation time, psi with respect to TR, is the initial state, which was the superposition, times evolution operator, which is e to minus i, Hamiltonian times in time over h bar. 
So during this dynamics, these two states, one and two, they gain some phase factors. So in front of one is just e to the power minus i energy of the first state times t. In front of the uh, second state in the superposition, we have phase factor which depend on, depends on the energy e2. In other words, during this dynamics, actually there arises some uh, relative phase between states one and two. So this is called phase imprinting sometimes. And then there is the second pi over two pass. So in the red frame, you have again uh, some short reminder what this pass is doing. Uh, in our system, this pass is taking this phase factors with relative phase E1 minus uh, E2 into arguments of sine and cosine. So after the second pi over two pass, we still have superposition, but it's no longer half-half superposition. It's superposition with superposition with uh, sine, the, with sine and cosine uh, of arguments depending on the relative phase. And then at the end is measurement. And what we, usually what is measured is just the number of atoms in state two minus number of atoms in state one. And average value of this operator, average of n1 minus n, n2 minus n1, is equal to total number of atoms times cosine. And in the argument, there is this energy difference e2 minus e1 times interrogation time. So I think actually the crucial part here to understand the relation between the final measurement and the, the relative phase is this pi over two pass. Because before pi over two pass, these energies E1 and A2, they are encoded in phase factors. And after pi over two pass, these differences in energies, they are, they are encoded in a populations of, of one and two. Okay, and how, how we can use this sequence? So imagine that uh, your task is to measure energy difference E2 minus E1. This is the task. Yes, so you can perform this Ramsey interferometry, but uh, you can do it a few times, changing interrogation time TR. So let's imagine that uh, this was done and you have two or three uh, measurements at different uh, interrogation times TR. Then what you have to do, you have to just to fit this n times cosine, or if this divided by n, just cosine, uh, to the measured points. And from this fit, you can learn what was the difference of the energies E2 minus E1. But usually, actually, what is known, well, usually the, this energy difference is not it's not completely unknown. Yes, usually we have some guesses about these energies. So usually, uh, maybe I will. The problem with this is that uh, I don't know when you would ask questions. Maybe I, I will. Unmute, un unmute all of them. I mean, everyone can unmute themselves if they press the space. Also, if now we, we wish we will manage to ask questions. There is also this functionality that we can raise our hand to indicate. Yeah, the question, the problem is that if I'm full screen mode, then I do not see your reaction. Okay, let's continue. Maybe it has some advantages, no? Okay, so usually when we like to measure some energy difference, E2 minus E1, this is not completely unknown uh, quantity. Usually you have some predictions that it should be equal to some uh, frequency omega naught times H bar. And actually what we want to measure, these are small deviations, small corrections from this predicted omega naught and its actual value. This is a difficult task. And the, the question is how to measure it as precisely as possible. So probably everyone had to do such exercise during uh, 
laboratories in, in uh, universities, uh, which was to measure period of pendulum. And uh, if you are asked to do this, the best way is to start this pendulum to oscillate and then wait uh, until it will oscillate many, many times. This many times is this letter K here. And then we measure time and we divide uh, the time until after, let's say, 100 oscillations, over 100, and then we have some quite precise measurement of one period. So the same idea is here in Ramsey interferometry. If you have some guess about this omega naught, the best way is to wait several oscillations, assuming that the, the, the frequency was close to omega naught, and then at some interrogation time TR, you do the measurement. And the best way is to do measurement at this point at which the slope is maximal. So where this signal imbalance n to minus in one, n one over n when it's crossing zero. Because then uh, the signal is the most sensitive to the interrogation time. So only small change in the argument will give a big change in the signal to remind you, signal is number of atoms in the state two minus number of atoms in state one. Usually, by convenience, it's divided by the total number of atoms. Okay, if you do this measurement, and you see that uh, your measurement is, let's say, above zero, it means that your predicted frequency was not the correct one, and that the correct one is slightly higher. And again, fitting just sign to the neighborhood of this, you can infer what was this correction delta omega. This is how it's done in uh, atomic clocks. Usually they, they wait like nine, uh, 10 to the power 9 of oscillations. Okay, but the problem is that if you do this measurement, very often mm, you have some noise. Well, always there is some noise. And if everything would be super precise and there would be no, uh, well, if you, you could control very well this interrogation time with your local oscillator and you repeat the experiment, then from shot to shot, you have different measurement results because some other noises, also some quantum noises. So the, there, will, there will be some spread of measurements and the spread of measurements is denoted with delta and rel. And then assuming that you are close to this point at which signal is zero actually, and if you fit sign to this point, we would like to, to fit sign, you assume that sign of the argument for small arguments is close to argument itself. So what would mean that this uh, spread of points would correspond to spread in the relative phase before the final pi over two pass. There are other ways to define uh, uncertainty of phase, namely what uh, people are doing, they, they are also doing some, some people just called phase Ramsey interferometer. And phase Ramsey interferometer is like normal Ramsey interferometer, but just at the second pi over two pass, uh, there was also applied another, another pass, which is just giving adding some extra relative phase phi r between states one and two. And there is pi over two pass, and then there is this typical measurement number of atoms in state two minus number of atoms in state one, which is in balance. And here there are, below you see some pictures from such measurements, when on the x axis is this added phase with this, with this extra laser pass, and on y axis you see this relative number of atoms. And these are actually real measurements. So what they do, they repeat this experiment several, several times for different added phases. And then uh, from that, they can uh, they see some spread of points. And from that, they can infer what was the uh, uncertainty of phase in the measurement. For instance, fitting sign, and then uh, amplitude of the sign would be uh, e to minus delta phi square over, over two, assuming Gaussian noise in, in the position of the sign. 
there are different estimators of this delta phi. Okay, this is how it's done. And uh, one practical remark, I was uh, describing only internal state of the atoms. So of course, in, in practice, these atoms are moving like in this, uh, uh, in this black box. Some of them are fast, some of them are, are slow. And uh, to really describe the system, one should write the wave function, which depends on position and also on this internal state. Because indeed, the, the thermal motion of atoms is a big problem. Usually, uh, such samples are, are cooled down to very low temperatures, and sometimes they are even cooled down to something which is called Bose Einstein condensate. So, uh, what is Bose Einstein condensate? Uh, I was presenting it uh, several times, but one can think uh, also about this in as, uh, as this state, which is in this uh, uh, green frame. So, if you have thermal state, and thermal state is up to normalization e to minus Hamiltonian, but the full Hamiltonian also with partial degrees of freedom over temperatures time Kb, it turns out that this mixed state for low temperatures, but not super low temperatures, for bosons is very close to a pure state plus some correction, yes. And moreover, this pure state, uh, it appears to be a product state. So the state psi, which is here, usually uh, if written in the first quantization form, is just n atoms occupying the same orbital, which is, uh, this orbital is called both the Einstein complex. And it's happening even in relatively high temperature, in the sense that it's happening even if the say average temperature per atom is 10 to power 4 of h bar omega in, in a in local oscillator which is trapping the atoms so in average the energy is very very high still atoms will gather in some one single orbital which is not necessarily the ground state usually it's not because of interaction and the state of the system is close to a pure state. And the only thing you have to know is just this orbital, which you can compute with different methods using gross Petersky equation. And then indeed, the only thing you have to worry about are these internal levels, as in Ramsey scheme. So what are advantages of both the Einstein condensate? So the main, uh, well, the main concept here is the superposition. And in solid state physics, if you have superposition of two levels, it, it dies very quickly after, I don't know, maybe femtosecond, maybe nanosecond, but quickly. And in atoms is different. You can, you can create superposition of uh, internal levels of atoms. And this superposition as shown here is, can survive until uh, 30 seconds. Moreover, both the Einstein condensate is very small. It's, a, it's the cloud of atoms with the diameter like one uh, micrometer or something like that. And people created in proof of principle experiments a uh, scanning probe microscopes in which you can you can control the position of this Bose-Einstein condensate and you can probe local magnetic fields. So such microscopes were built already. Uh, this system is very tunable. You can change the interaction between atoms, you can change the geometry of the trap in which these atoms are many things can be easily controlled. And now one can say also that it's robust. I mean, there are experiments in which uh, both the Einstein condensate is generated remotely on board of flying rockets. So there are such experiments that are launching rocket during this fly, both the Einstein condensate is created on board and then the rockets uh, fall down onto earth during this flying, they are gathering some, collecting some measurements. And then the, this rocket is taken back and one hour later, they launch it again. And again, both the Einstein condensate is created on the board and uh, there are experiments, it's, shut, it's touching the ground and again and again. Uh, and they are doing this because there are plans to send both the Einstein condensate into space to measure very precisely gravity and test equivalence principle. <coughs> 
So I'm working with group uh, with Bas from Basel University, and this is a group which has very special system. So they have atom chip. They can uh, inject currents in this chip because there are currents. They uh, then these currents induce a magnetic field, and with this magnetic field, one can keep atoms, but they are usually uh, kept. They are held below the chip. And here there is the picture of uh, of their system. So there is this chip on top. There is glass cell, almost perfect vacuum is inside. And this thing, which is well, like one centimeter of diameter, it's kept on the optical table when there's plenty of laser. So in the second picture, somewhere there is this chip, but most of these cables, there are some lasers and fibers, and, and, and they control this from outside. So inside this, this glass, glass cell, there is some tiny Bose-Einstein condensate, which is well isolated from environment and is controlled by laser beams. Uh, and they are able to prepare Bose-Einstein condensate in super low temperature. So average energy of atom divided by Boltzmann constant is of the order of 50 picokelvin. Uh, this group is really good in, uh, in production of in producing squeezed states in metrology, and they also they can tune number of atoms. They usually usually using uh, rubidium from 100 to 10,000. So what you see at the bottom is their measurement of delta phi, this relative phase, I mean dispersion of the relative phase, versus interrogation time in seconds. So you see that the, the longer is this interrogation time, uh, the higher is dispersion. So less precise are the measurements. So the question we ask is, what are the sources of this increase? What are the main contributions? There are few few important ingredients. Let me start with something which is called quantum noise. So if everything would go smoothly. Then at the end of Ramsey sequence, the state of the atoms should be this thing which is in the frame. It should be a product state in which every atom is in the same superposition of state one and two, half half superposition. Yes, so in this state in average, the number of atoms in state one is equal to the average number of atoms in state two, and it's equal to total number of atoms over two, because these were half, half superposition. So in this state, this imbalance, this signal is equal to zero on average. But still, all other possibilities of, uh, let's say, having even all atoms in state one, there are possible. There is some distribution of possible outcomes of this experiment. So this average imbalance is equal to zero, but it has dispersion which is proportional to one over square root of n. Because just the number of atoms in n1 and in, or in n2, it follows a binomial distribution and the width of binomial distribution is square root of n. And because n rel is imbalance divided by n, that's why the result is one over square root of n. And this thing is called projection noise quantum noise. And the task in quantum metrology are to modify this uh, Ramsey sequence and to choose maybe better input state such that this quantum noise at the end would be as small as possible. And in quantum metrology, all the typical question is what are the fundamental limits? So how small this noise can be? So now there's the question if this effect is quantum projection noise is important in experiment or it's not? And the question is, the answer is that it depends. So for the first time it was observed that it exists in a, in a real atomic clock uh, like 20 years ago concerning this Basel experiment. This is their measurement, but now on the X axis is time, but on short time scale. This dotted line is projection noise. They had like 1,020 atoms. They can uh, really count atom one by one. 
what means that this projection noise should be like one over square root of uh, 1000, so around 0 0.03. 0 .03, it's marked with this dashed line. And the dots are measurements. So we see that until 10 milliseconds, this quantum projection noise is important, and then and then it's not. Then it's ha a different thing uh, are happening. What are these different things? Well, typical guess would be that probably the experiment is not perfect because there are some technical noises. So what they did, they measure different technical noises. They repeated experiments several times in different geometries and different temperatures, also not for Bose-Einstein condensate, for very diluted samples, and they measured technical noise well, as well as they were able to. And this technical noise is marked as this black line. This is the technical noise or the impact on the de delta phi on, uh, from coming from this technical noise. And these red points, these are measurements of phase uncertainty, which is actually the uncertainty of this uh, imbalance of number of atoms in one and two. So still the question remains, what is responsible for, for this large fluctuations of phase? or large fluctuations of the relative number of atoms measured at the output. So what was omitted? I, I was not discussing now, for now, uh, collisions between atoms. Because if you have Bose-Einstein condensate, so it's actually very small cloud of atoms, quite dense in the sense that you cannot omit usually interactions. And these are neutral atoms, so the interactions are very weak. But still, there are van der Waals uh, interactions, just collisions between atoms. And these collisions usually are divided into two groups. One group are elastic collisions. And here we have three channels, because we have atoms in the states one and two. So there are uh, different, uh, well, different constants uh, are governing the the collision, collisions between atoms uh, in one. There are different uh, parameters controlling or describing the interactions between two atoms from which one is the, in the state one and the second is in the state two. And there is the first parameter for this channel two, two. Similarly for inelastic collision, inelastic are actually, they are calling it inelastic, but these are such collisions that two atoms collide and they change internal levels. And as the trap was magnetic trap, if the atom change internal level, usually it's lost from the trap. But because of some super selection, well not super, because of some selection rules, there are only two channels. I mean, for these atoms which were used in Basel, there are only two channels for inelastic collisions. And uh, the rate of these inelastic collisions are denoted with gamma one, two and gamma two, two. So we have uh, collisions and these collisions are governed by five parameters. Three of them to characterize elastic collisions. These are scattering clamps, denoted with A, and two of them <coughs> to describe or to quantify inelastic collisions. So first focus on inelastic collisions. There's a small table, and these are results of, of different groups in which there's gamma one, two, and gamma two, two are measured. And you see that, uh, well, the result differs. Yes? There was some question? No? Okay. These are some experimental measurements of rates of inelastic collisions. And you see they are not consistent with each other. That's why this group in Basel they, they measure these rates by themselves. So first they prepare atoms only in, but they prepare a cloud of atoms from which all atoms were in state one. And they measure how many atoms remains as a function of time. Then they repeat, repeated this experiment, but only for atoms in state two. And then they have superpositions. And from that they infer new loss rates, which are in this red table. And you should know that the really top group concerning the precision of, of measuring number of atoms. So 
and they also have very quick repetition of this experiment, so they have quite la uh, good statistics and probably this measurement is the best measurement of this of this constant. And this was done by mostly by a PhD student from Basel, uh, Ifan Lee. And now the, the role of elastic collisions. So if these are elastic, you have to uh, add them to your Hamiltonian. People know how to do it. So I just presented this Hamiltonian. This is old Hamiltonian, but there are some corrections. These corrections comes the discorrections come from interactions. There are two additional terms. One is in this green frame, and the second is in red. Uh, one can just derive this Hamiltonian uh, for interacting poser Einstein condensate. And then you'll find that, at least in this Basel experiment, in this setup, the first correction was very, very small, this chi times n2 minus n1 squared. And it was small because it depends on some uh, combination of scattering clamps. All of them are very close to each other. So that's why this coefficient was almost zero. And there is a ne next correction. This with chi tilde times total number of atoms times imbalance between states one and two. And this turned out to be dominant correction. But if you look at this, you will see that it depends on the total number of atoms. So what they can do in this experiment, they, they can do analysis of this uh, measured data, this is here, and then can look at what was this uh, imbalance, which they call phase, as a function of the total number of atoms, just from single shot experiment. So they see some correlation. And we know that there should be some correlation because of this term in the Hamiltonian. But once we know it, we can uh, do some post-analysis on the data, and we can subtract phases depending on what was the total number of atoms, the final measured number of atoms. And after this, the, one can remove this, uh, this correlation and improve the precision of this measurement. So by the way, they were able to, in fact, doing this, we are measuring this uh, chi tilde parameter. Chi tilde depends on difference a to 2 minus a11. So in fact, what they are doing, they are actually measuring this difference of scattering clamps. And concerning scattering clamps of, of rubidium, it turned out that also uh, literature is not clear about the values of scattering clamps. So these are different uh, measured uh, scattering clamps. You see that are, all of them are close to each other, but it turned out that this experiment is so precise that if I would change the scattering clamp by less than 1%, I would have no agreement with experiment whatsoever. Actually, we can measure this, I mean, we can infer that this difference from the experiment with the precision 0 0.1 of 1 over Boridia, which is which is actually that quite good precision. So what I was doing, I was doing uh, just simulation for them. Uh, I was working on this system. Uh, I'm working on this system since many years, uh, trying to well, model both the Einstein condensates, their dynamics, losses, and different noises. So uh, there are papers in which I was describing in details with my colleagues from uh, Grenoble and Paris uh, what are the main uh, effects, what are mechanism, mechanisms uh, which are induced by losses. Now, working with this experimental group, I had to, well, I had new values of two-body loss rates, and I, have, I had the correct values of scattering clamps. We also checked that these parameters of this Hamiltonian, this chi and chi tilde, they are actually time dependent. I was able to, to, to model this time dependence. They were able to measure this time dependence. So just collaborating with this group from Basel, finally we, could, we were able to, to well, improve theoretical models. And then I used them to, uh, to 
compute uh, experimental measurement to have some curves, theoretical curves to compare with, with uh, delta phi. So what you see now is again this delta phi versus Ramsey time, but these red points are quite close to what came from theoretical model, which included only losses, time dependence of parameters, which is so what was included is essentially the, the particle losses and, and uh, interactions between atoms. Then once they do this correction after measuring what was the uh, mean shift of phase due to number of atoms, this gave this blue experimental points. Uh, using Monte Carlo analysis, I generated uh, data for them and they did from my theoretical data, data from simulation, uh, they did the same analysis as they do for their data, and this gave them this uh, blue points. So I would say that we have a nice agreement between theory and experiment, and we learn what are the main contributions, but to be sure we should repeat this experiment. Uh, maybe it will be better in such a regime in which number of uh, collisions is smaller. Because if the number of collisions would be smaller, then this uh, phase noise would be also smaller. Because as we see from this curve, the dominant effects are uh, elastic collisions, which gives the difference between red and blue, and then uh, losses, which gives the difference between blue and technical noise. So they repeated this experiment with shallower trap. I did the simulations, and again, we had quite nice agreement. So it's almost everything. This is this uh, team, six people from uh, Basel working on experiment. I was doing theory for them. Uh, to sum up, we performed very detailed analysis of phase noise in the Ramsey interferometry. From that, we were able, or they were able to measure uh, some atomic constants like uh, rates of inelastic collisions and uh, scattering clamps. And doing some analysis, they, are, they were able to improve precision, just choosing different geometry uh, for, for the trap, keeping the atoms. So now there are some plans. We'd like to uh, improve meteorology using squid state. Uh, to do this, uh, they would like to use the state-dependent potentials because on this chip, they can create two independent traps, one for atoms in state one and the second for atoms in state two and one can uh, play with these parameters. So they would like to optimize it. I would like to improve uh, my theoretical understanding of the system because, well, this is actually a very difficult system to describe it uh, in all details. Always you have to do some, uh, some crude uh, simplification and uh, uh, what I'm working on is many body dynamics with particle losses included. And in the far future, we'd like to create a Schrodinger cut state. We wrote a proposal already to, for three years ago, but they were trying to create a Schrodinger cut state in these systems, but it, was, it turned out to be difficult. But now, as we know that there are uh, different loss rates and different scattering plans than we assume, and we understand the system better, maybe there's a chance to, there's a chance to, uh, to finally do it. So it's everything. If you are still with me, you can ask questions. Okay, yes. So this is the time for questions. I open the discussion. So if you want to ask the question, you have to unmute your uh, microphone. Um, so, Ksusia, can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, you, towards the end, you, you said that, let's say, your model matches quite well with experiments, but as far as I understood in the regime of uh, uh, well, many co collisions. Uh, the model was quite off from the like data points, including error bars. So, can you comment on this? Yeah. So, uh, I will show it again. You are saying, for instance, about yeah. this, especially here for this blue curve. You see that there are some deviations. So, <clears throat> we found out that uh, for longer times, because losses were so substantial that. Uh, and also asymmetric in one of these uh, cloud. One of these clouds is very, very small uh, for atoms in a, in a 
state two. And the cloud for atoms in state one is much broader because uh, the losses are asymmetrical and they, they are mostly present in, in state two. That's why overlap between these two clouds is not perfect. So the deviation is due to uh, finite, well, the reduction of overlap between these two modes. It's like in optics to have, to do some, uh, I know, even beam speeder, <coughs> if you inject two beams at once, you have to take care about uh, mode matching. It's the same thing. And this is not perfect. It's difficult to model. That's why, uh, well, it was not included in this theory, but this is, this, it seems that this is the, the main reason uh, for this deviation. Uh, thanks. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So, Krzysztof, is there any canonical way to include those losses to, to, to make it uh, better? So, yes, we know that we have to use master equations. It's already, well, I was also deriving it for this model, and we know that it, it should work, uh, but I, I haven't, this equation is not written explicitly, but mm -hmm. um, it would not change much if I would write it down, because anyhow, this is an equation which is impossible to solve uh, analytically or even numerically, with, uh, in including all effects. So I'm using master equation, but under approach that there are only two modes which are important, spatial modes, <coughs> and these are state for state one and two. And if I would add more modes, then uh, this equation, master equation here would be impossible to solve. Okay, thanks. Um, anyone uh, else? Uh, Very nice seminar and the proof that we can run it like this. Forever. It's different. It's very different. No? Forever, right? If necessary. Okay, so if there are no uh, more questions regarding Krzysiek's talk, let's uh, thank him once again. Oh.